Scripture 101 is a series which seeks to highlight certain books of the Bible and to give its listeners a better appreciation and basic understanding of the Word of God in sacred scriptures. Your program host is Father Jim Corda. Hello and welcome to this edition of Scripture 101. I'm Father Jim Corda. Our presenter today is Father George Belasco, and we're going to talk about the Torah. Welcome to our show today. Thank you, Father. When we say the Torah, what exactly do we mean by Torah? Well, Torah actually means law, and so, but it's more than law, it's like a way of life. So the uh, Jewish community we, uh, calls the five books of the Bible uh, the Torah, the teachings. And supposedly the teachings came from Moses. Originally, it said he's the character behind everything in the Torah. The five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. But he is the persona, even though he possibly, you know, he couldn't have written everything that's there. Because uh, in one of my uh, cheat sheets here, it says, you know, the Bible is about a thousand years to get it in this type of book, uh, in Biblia, uh, which is Greek for books. And so what we see that Moses then, in uh, giving the law, recording it in those different books of the Torah, the five books, what we find is that he is the one who gives us a way of life. God reveals to Moses what has to be uh, implemented by the people. Now when we say Torah, is that word interchangeable with Pentateuch? Well, Pentateuch comes from the Greek translation of the Torah. You know, when you go from Torah to Pentateuch, it means five books. Mm -hmm. You know, Pentagon, the, the five-sided building down in Washington. And basically when you get, that's the number five in, uh, in Greek. So th when they translated from Hebrew into Greek, about a hundred years before the birth of Jesus, down in Egypt, then you get the Septuagint, the tradition that 70, scribes, 70 sages wrote down everything in translating it from the Hebrew to the Greek. So that's the Greek way of referring to the Torah and the Septuagint. So when, when the Jewish people read the Bible, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, they refer to those first five books of the Bible as the Torah, Torah. As, as the law, as their way of life. Probably similar for us as, as Christians that the New Testament is kind of our way of life. Would that be a, a, an apt simile? Well, I would give one section of the uh, Christian scriptures, the introduction to Luke and to Matthew, the infancy narratives. That would be the introduction to the Christian teaching. It's at the baptism of Jesus that everything starts for Christianity. And, and Mark records that for us in, you know, by the baptism scene. So I think our sacred writers in the New Testament were following the example of the writers of the Old Testament. And so there's a story before the story. See, the, for the Torah, it starts off with the Abraham story. Then we have to say, where did Abraham come from? Then you had the story of the creation account. Then you also have the flood account. Then you have the tower building. And all of that comes from Mesopotamia. And that's the culture and the, and the stories that were told in Mesopotamia. And uh, some of the rabbis, uh, more orthodox, don't agree with this, that Ezra and Nehemiah probably were the ones who edited the Bible, the Torah, as we have it today. Although prior to that, there are some editions of it and the different traditions, if we want to get into that. Mm -hmm. Let's go back and, and focus a little bit more on um, the first book of the Torah, uh, the, the book of Genesis. You know, obviously the book begins in the beginning. So is that giving us a, a historical background, uh, a chronology of, of God creating things from the begin, beginning of time? Well, yes, because again, the idea they would see is God creating in that tradition, priestly tradition, uh, God created just by pronouncing the word. And so in the beginning, you know, that actually said Barashet, which is actually the word in Hebrew for in the beginning. Yeah. But maybe a, a footnote, we better, those four traditions talking about. There's a Yahweh's tradition, and it's a, the sacred name for God. And God walks in the cool of the garden in that tradition. Then there's another tradition where God is called Elohim. And it's in the plural. It doesn't mean Trinity. 
Just the idea that it was like angels. Sometimes we see translation that the angels, okay? But basically, it was from a pagan concept of God, an Elohim. And so there's a tradition that the Elohist wrote a story. That's the story of uh, Joseph dreaming, because God would appear in visions and in dreams and angels. Then you have the priestly tradition, and that's the beginning of the account of Genesis. And then you also have the book of Leviticus, it's all priestly. All how do you worship at the temple? Temple's not built yet, but yet you're having all these instructions to show you it was edited later on in history to talk about the um, sacrifices that would be done at the temple. Then you continue the narration of uh, uh, the Exodus in the book of Numbers and what happened there. And then uh, at the time of Solomon, and someone uh, just reminded me a couple weeks ago in something I was reading, probably at the time that Nehemiah, not Nehemiah, uh, one of the kings, uh, David, uh, did a uh, clearing out of the, uh, the house, okay? And there was um, tensions between priests there. We see Aaron as the high priest. But Moses is considered a high priest too because he taught everything Aaron needed to know and there was a statement, I don't remember in Latin, you might remember, if you don't have it, you can't give it. So Moses must have had it, and so he gave it to Aaron, and he would be the high priest. But the symbol for the high priest uh, of, of Moses was the, uh, the serpent on the pole. And uh, at that time, uh, I thought it was always with Solomon, that when he tried to give the priesthood entirely to Aaron, they expelled the uh, Mosaic priest. And they went up north, just a little bit, not, not to the northern tribes, but uh, to the tribe of Benjamin, and they edited Moses' version of receiving the law at Mount Sinai. And if you ever read the book, I'm sure some of you have, it's a one-man story. Uh, you know, if, if some, uh, my colleague, in a sense, sometimes goes out and he acts out Paul and gives like a uh, personal one-man show on what Paul would have been, uh, if you would have one man doing a show on Moses, it, his script would be the book of, of uh, Deuteronomy. And that means the second giving of the law. It's a second story on how the law was given. And so that was the fourth author? Fourth, fourth tr tradition. Okay. And the, the fourth tradition was that uh, it, God was present in the temple. Destroy the, pre the temple and God's no longer present to the people. The priestly tradition, strongly in our midst, if you want to get to God, go see the priest. We have that with the changes in the liturgy when people are, lay people are giving communion. Some people still cross over to the priest because he's more sacred than the lay person. So basically that was the priestly tradition. Want to get in touch with God, come and see the priest. And those four traditions are kind of important. And so when it was edited, these four traditions were edited together. And I put it in the school of Ezra during the time of the Babylonian exile. They're out there on probably uh, stone tablets Oral tradition first, telling the story in an oral way, then someone like a scribe writing it down first on clay tablets. That's why when Moses comes down from the mountain, he breaks the tablets. Why? They broke the covenant. Uh, they were worshiping a golden calf. So it's not the idea that he was angry. It's that he broke the covenant. And then he had to go back up the mountain, and then he had to get a second set of tablets, and it's on stone. And then you see them going to... Well, the parchment, taking the written word, the oral word, and writing it down. And it's something like this scroll here. Mm -hmm. And then down in Egypt, they started to pound reeds together and make a papyrus. Mm -hmm. And there you have a copy of what papyrus looks like. And Dom, Brother Dominic brought that back when from Egypt. But uh, the papyrus then would be laid page by page. And then that would make a book. And they would ship the papyrus up to Byblos, which was a coastal city in Phoenicia and they would ship it out from there, and that's where you get the world. And it's biblia, it's plural, for books. So the Bible that we have is a library of many books, not just one book. So, so the Bible and, of course, the Torah, it's not, it's not just um, a collection of, of books, sacred books, but it, it also tells us of the process, uh, ongoing process of, of humankind and the communication and how uh, words and traditions get written down and remembered um, from ancient times. And obviously the oral tradition is very important. How and why is that important uh, in the Torah? 
Well, again, the Torah doesn't have any vowels. So in order to be able to pronounce the words in the Torah, you need an oral tradition on how the word is to be pronounced. They just use consonants. And later on, one of the sages or the scribes started to have vowel pointing, and so you get the correct interpretation. Here's a misinterpretation uh, of Yahweh, called Jehovah. It's the four letters for Yahweh. It's Yod, He, Vav, He, it's Y, H, W, H. And they put the vowels for Adonai, which is a um, not offending name for God. Uh, it says Lord, like. And so they put the vowels from Adonai underneath Yahweh and you get Jehovah. And it's, uh, it's just a mis... And it's a correct mispronunciation. It, you were never... We're taking reverence with the word of God here, Yahweh. Some of our hymns were changed. But we would sing the word now as, Lord, we know you are near, because we, out of respect for that word, Yahweh. And uh, it's, we don't know if that's really the name for God. It, it was given to Moses at Mount Sinai, I am who am. And that's, and the high priest, when we get the book of Leviticus, he has to go in the day of uh, Yom Kippur, on the day of atonement, and he has to pronounce the name of God. Then if he comes out alive from behind the uh, screen or the curtain with the Holy of Holies, the people's sins are forgiven. If he dies back there, their sins for that year are not forgiven. There's a whole tradition on how you get the priest out when he dies. <laughs> There's an interesting um, thing that you were talking about, and that is that uh, they do not pronounce or say the name of God. And yet there's that uh, Yahweh's tradition that has God walking with them oh. in the cool of the garden. So there's this anthropomorphism that happens, this God is one of them, and yet they do not say the name of God. What's that? Is that a contradiction at all? No, it's just the idea that that, that tradition is that God is walking among us. You know, he's easy to get to. You know, he's not foreign to us. He's walking in our history. That doesn't mean we don't have respect for his name and the person of God, but that's the second creation account, huh? that he picks up the clay of the earth and forms Adam, which means man, then takes the rib from man and makes a woman. Okay, that's the second creation account. The first creation account is priestly. Male and female, he made them. Huh? Then you get a story of Midrash, that's, that, that first one was Lilith. Uh -huh. And then she has trouble with man and so she goes, flies off to another place. Then you get a second account of, actually, uh, it could be, um, what do you call when the, the guy is looking down at women, okay? That's the word I want. Uh, a sexist or yeah, a... Yeah, uh, the idea that yes, basically she's yes. like an extra rib yes. walking around, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but as Father Maley taught us, it's closest to the heart, to love. It's not, she's not to be stepped on nor is to rule over, but to be one with men. But that's the Yahweh's tradition. I like the Yahweh's tradition. If I, of the four traditions, I like the Yahweh's tradition. He walks among uh, the garden. He walks with the people. He, he created us, even clothes them after they have committed a sin. And by the way, they're given clothing that, uh, uh, that was taken from the animals, okay? That was given to the priest when the sacrifices were carried out in the temple, or when, even if the, before the temple was built. And so basically he makes them priestly people, even though they're expelled from the garden. And so, you know, these different traditions, I, you know, uh, some people like the, Yahweh, uh, the Elohist tradition, angels and dreams, you know, people talk about that today. And then of course, oh, God's only in place, Deuteronomus. Priestly tradition, only the priestly tradition can handle uh, the things of God. So, you know, Whoever edited said, all four are valuable, let's keep them together. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit more about um, uh, the, uh, the whole sense of, of ritual and worship within the Torah. That's obviously very important uh, to the Jewish people. Where does that come in, in uh, the Torah, the, the whole sense of worship, the temple? When does the temple become important? Well, the temple became important right at the time of Abraham. The idea that sacrificing to the one God actually uh, thought that human sacrifice was needed. And then we see that story in Genesis where they call it the binding of Isaac story, that Isaac has taken up the mountain, Mount Moriah. Today that would be temple, uh, that where the temple mountain was located. Uh, we saw just a reading in one of our masses this past week, whenever this is uh, going to be broadcast, 
the idea would be that um, Gideon was told to take the sacrifice at this city called uh, Yahweh Shalom, mm -hmm. Jerusalem. And so that's way before Jerusalem is actually thought of in the mind of David. And now it's being applied in that document of Judges that this is the, where God's peace dwells. And so what we see there, the sacrifice of humans was sort of the more, uh, norm in that culture and background. And so Abraham is told not to sacrifice Isaac. And then you have a ram that's being taken in place. And so the animal sacrifices now are being used instead of human sacrifices. And the key there is very interesting that Abraham, uh, Isaac was 37 years of age. Everybody thinks when you see the, uh, the artworks and all that, he's like a young guy, okay? And basically, you know, we know he's 37 because Sarah conceives him at 90 and she dies at 127. So basically, she dies when she thinks that Isaac has been sacrificed. And so that whole story, that's where we get he's 37 years of age. And then we have the Torah, okay, we have it in Hebrew. Then, then when they translate it to Aramaic, it's called a Targum. Targum means translation. They added something to the story that Isaac and, uh, and Ishmael were arguing over who should have the birthright. And so Ishmael says to Isaac, you know, I let dad circumcise me when I was 12 years old. He said, you had no choice in the matter. You were circumcised on, your, on the eighth day after you were born. And so Isaac says, if God would demand my very life, I would lay it down. The angel said, there's your Elohim tradition. Mm -hmm. Angels said, what did you say? And then Abraham was told to take him and sacrifice him up at Mount Moriah. So there you have, you know, that, that little story of the binding of Isaac's story giving way to the sacrifices that would take place at the temple in Jerusalem when it would be built at the time of Solomon. After Moses received it at Mount Sinai, you had that tent where they would go around and keep on moving. And so the sanctuary was always there and they always had these sacrifices. And the book of Leviticus explains what sacrifices are to be offered. Morning sacrifices, evening sacrifice, sin offerings, Thanksgiving offerings. And so that would go for sunrise to sunset. And so basically that liturgy is very much a, uh, a part of our background because whoever wrote the letter to the Hebrews was a priest of the Jewish tradition, Aaron. Huh? And uh, the temple's destroyed now, and so there's no more sacrifices in Jerusalem, and they start to apply to Jesus the sacrifices that used to take place mm -hmm. at the temple in Jerusalem, praising God, giving him thanks, asking for taking away of sins. And we see that in the sense that our sacrifice of the Mass and our, our liturgy of the Eucharist, all those prayers are there when people say, they took away the sacrifice of the mass, you know. I said, well, which sacrifice? You know, it's a Thanksgiving offering. I mean, that's why the temple was, table was turned around because it's a meal. Mm -hmm. The sin offering, that's there, okay? And also the idea of praise of God. And so that's where the sacrifices come from. And, you know, the animal now replaces the human sacrifice. And why, you know, PETA would be upset about that, the animals, but the idea would be that uh, the animal represented us. When Jesus cleansed the temple, this is kind of interesting. Why did he cleanse the temple? They're selling the animals in the temple. Say, you're supposed to bring the animal for Passover and it's supposed to be your gift. And they used to buy him outside the gate. And then they would bring him into the priest to be sacrificed. So it was something they were giving. So what was happening now at the time of Jesus, they were like paying the price. Then the priest would pick the animal and then you would get it for Passover. Then Jesus says, no, you're making this a marketplace. Let the person buy the animal and bring it up to the temple as their gift offering for Passover. We're coming down to the last 10 minutes of our time together. Already? So we've got a little bit more that we want to talk about. Let's talk uh, primarily now briefly about the book of Exodus. That's where Moses uh, comes on the scene. What's so important about the book of Exodus uh, in the Torah? Well, Exodus is really the forming of the people of Israel. Uh, and so that whole story is that the, the back end of Genesis, where they ended up down in Egypt because of Joseph. And then we see 
At that time, the Pharaoh had forgotten who Joseph was, and he's suppressing the Hebrews. That's their name down in Egypt. Um, they think that name means someone who comes over across the river, like the Tigris and Euphrates, and uh, they're foreigners. And uh, he's upset by the fact that they are getting very populous and they may turn on us, okay? He enslaved them in some way, and uh, you know, they didn't have that under Joseph. Then all of a sudden, basically, he makes a ruling in the sense that these children, male children should be uh, slaughtered because they're getting too numerous. Save the girls, kill the boys. And we see his mother, Moses' mother, uh, saving him by putting him in a basket. So he's raised really as an Egyptian. And kind of clever by Miriam says, when the uh, Pharaoh's daughter finds her, him in the sea of reeds, you know, that's uh, in the basket. Uh, he says, uh, she says, would you like to have me find a wet nurse for you? And she said, yeah, that'd be very helpful. And so basically he goes back to his mother, mother. till he's till about 12 years old, I guess. And then he's turned back over to the Pharaoh's daughter. He's raised as a relative of the Pharaoh. And then that whole story, he, he kills someone and hides the body because he's uh, suppressing the, uh, the Hebrews. And then he has to flee. And he's out in the desert, uh, up in the mountains. And he, you know, modern day, uh, what we call the Sinai. And uh, he experiences God in the burning bush. Then he has to go back and bring out the people out of Egypt. Now we get all those plagues. All those plagues are really the gods that the Egyptians used to worship. They, they worshiped the Nile River because, man, if that didn't flood, you didn't have any crops. And all the, the frogs and all that, they would control pestilence by certain beliefs in God. And all those gods backfired. And then even they went back maybe to human sacrifice because the firstborn were actually uh, died on the Passover night. And the Jewish people took a lamb, took the blood, put it on the doorpost. There's your human, uh, hum, the uh, animal standing for the human sacrifice, and then they are let out. And then ending up at Mount Sinai and receiving the laws. The people said, yes, we'll do it. And then Moses is gone for a while, and they build a golden calf. And it's Aaron who builds it. You know, There's two traditions. You're seeing two traditions even in that story. Aaron says, I didn't do it. And he says, well, I asked for their jewelry, and I threw it into the fire, and it came out as a golden calf. And you think it's a, you know, a big bull in the sense that like at, at Canfield Fair. Now it's probably you know, the size of some of these books here. They're just a small little uh, 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 image of, of an, an animal. And it was Baal in the sense of a god of fertility. And that, that controlled life. So basically in the sense of needed food and you needed those animals. So basically that story is Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments. Uh, and by the way, I say, when you watch that movie, pay particular attention to it because the special effects was used by Jell-O, green Jell-O. They, they put it on a tabletop, it was a model, they brought up the heat, the, the Jell-O collapsed, they backed it up, and watch it, you go see the lumps of Jell-O falling in next time you see these Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeBill. Uh, let's talk about the book of Numbers briefly. What's so significant about that? Numbers, when you think of numbers, you think obviously of one, two, three, four. Is that what the book of well, numbers is Well, the numbers about? means they're counting now. Basically, they're starting. This is the rest of the journey. See, we had Genesis on how they got started. We got the call of Moses. Then we break that with the book of Leviticus. It's the book of holiness. This enters right in the center of, of the Torah. In fact, uh, when you get right to the center of the Torah, it's on a scroll like this, okay? When you come to the center of the scroll, of the Torah, the five books are together, it ends with uh, be like God, okay? And then once we get out of Leviticus, then you're back continuing the journey till you get up to the time of the book of Judges and, and, and Joshua taking them into the land of promise. And so Deuteronomy then is the retelling of that whole story. But the book of Numbers is how you get numbers, you were counting the tribes. They were actually, you know, <laughs> How many do you have? And count the heads and all that and so forth. And who would get what land portion? The tribe of Manasseh, tribe of Judah, tribe of, uh, of uh, Ephraim. And see, Joseph had two sons and Jacob adopted both sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Joseph got two portions. He was a favorite of Jacob. So he gets two tribes. Uh, they are Manasseh, but it's really the tribe of Joseph. And so that's was you hear that part of the history and, and the difficulties they have of being cursed by people, you know, because they asked to go through their land, going to the land of promise, they were forbidden, and, and then you still have Esau 
causing them some trouble, and you have Ishmael causing them some trouble, and uh, that's the story of the Book of Numbers. And uh, again, it's basically one tradition, one or two traditions that are woven together there. And then obviously Deuteronomy is the book of the law, the different laws and regulations. And we know that there were 613 laws that the Jewish people followed. Yes. Well, again, that would be more of the book of Leviticus. But the book of Deuteronomy is the one, that, one book edition. One of the story uh, on paperback is the book of Deuteronomy. Okay. So basically it tells, tells them how they come out of Egypt and then Moses tells the story. He's the man, the voice telling this how it happened. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, how significant is the Torah for us as Christians? It's crucial. Because you, you can't understand what Jesus is doing unless you understand what they're doing in the Torah. How does his death become the sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world? That's not coming from Egypt. That's not coming from the Greeks. That's coming from our basis in Judaism. And so basically, we have to understand that in the sense that, as uh, St. Jerome said, to be ignorant of the scriptures is to be ignorant of Jesus. And so we have to be aware that this is part and parcel of our understanding of what it means to be a Christian, knowing that Jesus did all these things as a Jew. Uh, he followed the prophets. He taught in their, in their um, model or mode. So yes, it's crucial. We thought we could get away with it you know, and didn't need it anymore. There was a guy by the name of Marcion, very powerful man in Rome, said you don't need the Old Testament because in that Old Testament, they call it the Old Testament, that God was a vindictive God. And in the Christian scriptures, he's a merciful, loving God. No, you go back there, he's a, he's a loving God back there. You can see him. And then of course, once you have the word of God, then you have someone writing it down, then you have on that third level, you, know, you have someone maybe pointing it in their direction of what they want to tell the people you know, and, and straighten them out or something or make critical criticism of a certain group or something. We have about uh, a minute left. Uh, give us a brief encapsulation of the Torah and why it's important and significant and what more we can learn from it. Well, it, it has to do with salvation history, that God decided to create us in his image and likeness. And then he reveals himself to us on how we are to act. It's really like in your glove compartment, you're gonna have a manual on how to operate your car. Uh, you don't buy a manual from another uh, dealer or another uh, uh, um, you know, make of car because you run into trouble. So basically it tells us how to live because our God created us to know him, to love him and to serve him. And so there it's all there laid out for us in the Torah. And then from there it continues on. You know, the book of Deuteronomy, uh, the, that tradition continues on when we get to the second part of the prophet. So. Well, Father George Blasco, thank you for being well, with us. And thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. Scripture 101 was a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. Your program host was Father Jim Corda.